for this afternoon. Is this on? It is on. Okay. I'll just hold it. Or not. Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brenda Bowen, and I'm a professor at the University of Utah, and I had the chance to reflect a bit on when I first met Margie in preparation for today, which was almost 20 years ago, actually 19 years ago, um, when I was looking at graduate programs and came to the University of Utah to explore whether there might be a chance for a PhD here and met. Margie Chan and she and Bill Perry had just gotten this grant from the a or, uh, from the American Chemical Society Petroleum Research Fund to study diagenesis of the Navajo sandstone and I remember meeting with Margie and she said well this project is going to require a lot of field work you're going to have to go out for days and days hike every exposed outcrop of the Navajo sandstone <laughs> are you <laughs> so we're going to get you llama teams to go into the backcountry. We'll get you a houseboat to go around on Lake Powell. I'm still waiting for the houseboat and some of the llama teams, but we did spend hundreds of days exploring the Navajo sandstone and, you know, quickly realized that the field areas were places where usually they draw either national monument or national park boundaries around these outcrops because that's a spectacular, iconic sandstone. Um, and I was very fortunate to then get to come and work with her for several years as her PhD student. Um, and from the beginning, Margie's mentorship was so field-based. You had to see the rocks, you had to be out in the rocks, and really I think this is what has defined so much of her career. She has seen more rocks, particularly of Mesozoic strata, on the Colorado Plateau than just about anybody I can imagine. Um, and spending time with her in the field, often with John and her boys who would join for field work. Um, she taught me so much about aeolian sedimentology, but then also diagenesis and geochemistry. And then we realized it's linked to the structural deformations. We're like, oh, we got to figure out structures. And through all of this, you know, other mentors might have said, no, you're supposed to be a sedimentary geologist, study this. But instead, Margie encouraged me to explore everything. And we were always finding new tools and new collaborators. She taught me the value of collaboration from the very beginning and working closely with Phil mm -hmm. and others. We really had a team of researchers working together. Um, I remember one of the first field tools she bought me was my very first digital camera, right? This was 2001, digital cameras were just coming online and she's like, there are these amazing things. And from the beginning said, you know, your field photos are your data. Those are not just pictures, they're data points and you need to document them and the meticulous field notes that she would take was really a part of her, her mentorship for me. Um, she also taught me very early the importance of balance in life. So she was out working hard in the field and writing papers, but then also was spending her Saturday morning scouring all of the, the yard sales and would show up with these treasures and things. She'd find me cool earrings or rocks or different things that she knew that I would value. And she is quite a collector and has the collector's eye, as many of you know and have benefited, benefited from. Um, she also taught me from the beginning as a grad student the importance of outreach and education and was always encouraging me to go volunteer for K through 12 types of outreach things and you know that it wasn't just about our research careers but about giving back to the next generation and I know that she's done that throughout her career. About halfway through my PhD we got to share a very unique adventure where we sort of stumbled onto Mars and had been studying diagenesis of the Navajo sandstone and everyone was writing papers about where could the hematite on Mars have come from and so we said well let's write a paper maybe it's diagenetic and so we wrote this paper that we didn't really think would get that much attention. And then we were at a meeting in Houston at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference and they come up on the Megatron and say the rover has just landed and their concretions. And I just remember having her like, we were right. We just didn't think we were right. And proceeded to then sit down together at her desk and write this nature paper that ended up getting quite a bit of attention and really putting Utah geology at the forefront of planetary research. Um, that also got us to things like meetings in Spain where I remember sitting with her in a courtyard with our Spanish colleagues under Mars. It was bright and red over us that night as we were trying to understand more about what this might tell us about the history of, of life on Mars. Um, this transition into the planetary science community for Margie I think was a really interesting point in her career. 
And she did it with just the right amount of bravado and tenacity that people had to listen to her as she came into the scene where there were, you know, longstanding leaders with kind of more igneous petrology experience. And she got to tell them, no, I've seen more sedimentary rocks than you have. And I can tell you what these features are in the sedimentary rocks that you're looking at. Um, her work has now in that area led to large proposals. She's served on many panels, given hundreds of invited talks, invited symposia, and has led, has led field trips here in Utah for the planetary community. And her tenacity in this work really helped bring the significance of terrestrial analogs to the attention of the planetary science community and has fundamentally advanced what we know about sedimentary geology and water processes on Mars. Um, when Margie first came to Utah as a professor in 1982, she just finished her PhD with Bob Dot in Wisconsin, and before that had done an undergrad degree at UC Davis and came here, and she was the first female professor ever in the geoscience department at the University of Utah, and in fact, at any university in the whole state of Utah. And so you could just imagine the you know, challenges that she was able to take on with grace and, you know, with a lot of talent and skill and train so many students. She has taken hundreds of students into the field. She has taught thousands of students skills around sedimentary geology. Um, and her research has really had amazing breadth. She studied rocks from the Precambrian through the Pleistocene um, and has worked on, you know, things that have now filled over 138 peer-reviewed articles. I know she's got more because we have one that we're working on revisions on right now. Um, and not only that, but has been a leader in things around geoethics and outcrop preservation and trying to make sure that we're keeping some of these key outcrops that can be there for future generations to be able to study as well. Um, she's really had a vision for the importance of earth sciences that we all have seen in the beauty of the Sutton building where I have the great pleasure of getting to work and really had this eye for how we could showcase and do something really special about the importance of earth sciences here in Utah. Um, seven years ago, I was lucky enough to have the chance to join Margie as a colleague at the University of Utah and I remember her calling me when I was still at Purdue when it wasn't clear if there was going to be two tenure track positions for both me and my, my husband and she said, you know, that's okay. You just have to be brave and try something new. There's still these really cool, weird, interdisciplinary things going on at the university, and you might be able to do something a little bit different if you're just brave and said, you know, just because something hasn't been done doesn't mean you can't do it. And taking her advice really has changed my career in so many wonderful ways. And I think that that vision of just because we haven't done this doesn't mean it can't be done is something that she's passed on to many of her students. So without taking any more of her time, Margie Chan. Boy, uh, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> and I think you can see why I was lucky to have Brenda as a student. And really I have to say that so many of uh, the students have made a big difference in what I've learned and um, really kind of enhanced my career. Um, being around young people all the time, you don't feel as old as you are. And that's been one of the, the great things. And also I want to mention that Casey, um, one of my current PhD students is here and um, he's, I'll show you some of the things that he does to help me with. So today I'd like to share um, something different that I don't think I've, I've talked with uh, many of you about and that's just the idea of geoconservation and preserving classic outcrops um, as resources and for accessibility. So um, today I'm going to talk about just three things. Number one, about how we use rock archives and some of the ethics of outcrops. Number two, I think you'll find this fascinating, it's what I call the case of the missing marble and has to do with some of the Moki marbles in Southern Utah. And then three, I do want to talk a little bit more about the technology and what I think is going to be happening in earth science in the future. So those are the three stories that we're going to start with. Number one, we work in really remarkable places. And when I think of all the places that I've had the chance to go to, I think it's really uh, incredible. And in particular, you think how many other occupations other than ours get to call this work? And we could be out here and people look at us and say, you can't be serious. You're not really working, are you? Um, but I think that our connection to the landscape and what we know about it so intimately really makes a difference. It should inspire us to be more concerned about what is actually happening to this landscape around us. And a lot of this falls into the field of geoheritage 
know, heritage has to do with significant uh, uh, places, and it can range from the history of the place to the beauty, aesthetic beauty of the place to the, the science of the place. And it includes the diversity at all different scales. Um, and then the uh, second aspect is geoconservation, which is more specifically the preservation and the conservation of heritage sites. So these two things in combination have really been getting a lot of attention um, over the last two decades. And in particular, you can see that there are publications and there are even um, journals that are specifically about geoheritage, geoconservation. So this is a very big movement that is happening globally. And in the U.S., I would say that we are slower to um, include some of these ideas. We have had this long-standing park um, <coughs> system, and the park system is certainly very good and helps preserve some of our land. But it doesn't actually cover some aspects where there's a dichotomy between public land and private land or even scientific um, archives that are important that are on private land, and how do we preserve some of those. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these issues of both geoheritage and geoconservation. <clears throat> Starting first with the rock archives, I think uh, all of us as earth scientists really believe in uh, having pristine outcrops. And really, the best outcrops have no parallel. I mean, to be able to see the, the major unconformity at Sticker Point or some of these other types of things are just really unique experiences. And these are some of the places where we can make key discoveries that can really influence science and give us the opportunity to explore these at depth or um, in, in deeper knowledge than we can usually do with other outcrops that aren't as good. So what we really love, whether it's on Earth or whether it's on Mars, are really pristine good outcrops that are going to give us the most information. But one of the challenges is that there's a lot of increased pressure. And in particular, what if those best outcrops are on private land where we don't have access? And even the places that we do have access to, um, a lot of times we're losing access because there are potential for lawsuits. And so there's too much risk to allow us to go onto the land to see some of these things. And then we also have the challenge in that a lot of our landscapes are being altered and they're actually changing in a very dynamic way so they aren't the same as what they used to be. So all these things in combination are really kind of challenging to um, some of the best outcrops. So I want to show you some examples of um, outcrops that we might consider the best, the most pristine, and what's happening to some of these. So this is an area that I think many of you have driven by. Um, this is right by the Moab Fault where you have the Jurassic um, Entrada sandstone juxtaposed against the Cretaceous uh, Cedar Mountain. So just, you know, that outcrop exposure alone just shows me the beauty of being able to see the hanging wall against the foot wall. But what's happened is that there's also really some spectacular examples of deformation bands that are in the foot wall. And these deformation bands have such great exposure that the students can actually measure and plot the deformation band densities and discuss the relationships to fluid flow. So you can see some of these examples of the deformation bands here in the foreground with the fault um, in the background. Um, unfortunately, what happened is that somebody went in and, um, several years ago without a permit and actually tried to extract some of the deformation bands you can see here. And it is illegal to use any uh, motorized instruments on BLM property without a permit. And so somebody actually tried to cut this out. This was actually taken several months afterwards. So it takes a long time for something like this to actually be repaired or be so, so that it's not noticeable. And, um, you know, many of the structural geologists were actually enraged that this happened because this was a site that they went to with students and now it's permanently marred. Um, some other areas that are classic examples of hummocky cross stratification are in the Cretaceous of the Book Cliff. You can see one of the best exposed examples of this beautiful bed showing hummocky cross stratification. This was up Tusher Canyon in a place where uh, many oil companies and uh, student field trips would go to look at hummocky cross stratification in the Black Hawk Formation. And some group um, from the UK actually went in and drilled holes here. Uh, we weren't, aren't really sure why, where they trying to look at the permeability as you go across you know, the um, hummocky cross stratification. But the bottom line is that it's really damaged that outcrop permanently. 
And so other students that come and want to learn from, this, from these outcrops are really quite unhappy with their predecessors that actually throw those holes in there. Um, and so this has been controversial. Um, the one company actually asked the people that did this to go back in and try to remediate. And the, um, the holes you know, can't really be remediated very well. But not only were the, those big holes, but there are also some of these other holes that someone did in a vertical sense right here it actually goes through several bits. So all of these are kind of altering the experience that you get, you get when you go to these. And the attempted remediation, as I mentioned, is not that good. You know, this particular uh, cement color doesn't really blend in. And I think you could actually do better. So uh, other things that have happened up the same canyon is that people have measured sections. And it might be kind of hard to see from here. But even people putting permanent section numbers on um, mar the ability to photograph pristine exposures. And so here's an example showing um, some of the uh, numbers that you can see here. And again, you know, while you might not think it's that bad, some people would like to take pictures of that without having those numbers in there. Um, another classic area is the Cretaceous Panther Tongue um, in Gentile Wash. Uh, many of us drive by this all the time that we're going down to Price. And uh, the owners of this property uh, for a long time haven't had any signage. But now the Black Hawk Coal Company actually uh, painted, excuse me, let me go back if I can, painted this on. And this is a no trespassing sign, even though it's not what we are used to seeing. And um, we do have to, as geologists, we have to obey this. Because if we don't, they're going to stop allowing access. And now this requires three days notice, written permission, in order to take even a student group up there. And um, this is such a good exposure that really we all have to respect the land use rules or risk everybody having access. And this is just a classic area to look at uh, fluvial dominated delta deposits. Other things uh, are considered geovandalism. Um, BLM says anytime uh, things are done without a permit and it leaves damage, that, that seems to be considered geovandalism. So here in a highly visited dinosaur track site um, in Grand Staircase, Escalante, somebody went in and did these drill holes, maybe to look at compaction of uh, footprint, not really sure. But um, the BLM paleontologist was quite unhappy about that and tried to, to start an investigation. And unfortunately, wasn't didn't have enough evidence to really pin down who had done it. Um, in another example from Scott Foss, who was the BLM paleontologist, this was a site of petroglyphs on a BLM trail in Nevada. And what happened is somebody went in to do paleomagic holes, and they did it right on the same face as the petroglyphs that were right on the trail. And um, the paleontologist was quite upset because he said he could have easily gone on the back side of the outcrop and taken the same drill holes without marring the petroglyphs. And the excuse was that the people that did this, and they knew who it was, they said, well, we didn't see any petroglyphs. Uh, I don't know how <laughs> there is any way that you can do that and not, not see that there's petroglyphs there. Um, another picture that was sent to me was one of this. This is out of the Great Basin um, from twice between Lake Powhatan deposit. And this was a two-foot tower that had naturally toppled over. And even though you might think, oh, nobody's ever going to see that, you know, there's a, a lot of geologists that get out there. And so this uh, geologist, Terry Blair, got out there. He said, you know, somebody tried to do some probably stratigraphy in there. But he was quite uh, dismayed that they had done this without even attempting any remediation. Um, not only did they take samples here, but they also took samples here where there was this beautiful head that was this coalesced to the uh, barrel. And again, it's marring the experience for others that would come afterwards. So remediation um, isn't too difficult, and I think maybe more of us should be carrying um, these little things in our backpack where all you need is a little baggie of some of this quick set cement. We all have water. You don't even probably need a cup because you can mix it in the plastic bag with water and some stick that you even find. And maybe we should have this and just remediate regardless of whether we did it or not. And it couldn't be too difficult. So uh, just to show you an example, if you have these before holes, all you have to do is mix up some of your quick set cement with some of the local rock, some of this material that's just right here, and it's much—it's a much better fit than uh, waiting years and years and uh, 
maybe it doesn't quite look as good if you don't have some of the natural material mixed in. I also wanted to point out what's happened even in some areas uh, that um, students go for field trips. And this, these are the Miocene evaporite um, in the surface basin of Spain. And this actually shows an area right here. And these are evaporites that are kind of naturally white, although they have a patina on them. And about half of the white marks that you actually see here, along here, are actually rock hammer kits. And what happens is that um, some field trips with uh, 50 students, and they all have new rock hammers, uh, and they come out here to look at the evaporite, and they've got their rock hammer, and they're going to hit right at the you know, waist level, and that's where all these, um, these hits are here. And, you know, again, it's actually damaging the outcrop, and um, maybe we really should be using rock hammers unless we absolutely have to, because it's just too easy to have it in our hand and just naturally want to hit something. Uh, and I can say that I've done that myself, <laughs> and I know, um, I know how it is. So half hammer will hit. Um, I think that this is a, a major problem. And we should maybe be changing our attitude towards the outcrops. Another example uh, from Norway is uh, where there's some garnet peridotite, so I thought I should just show a sedimentary rock, maybe show a, a, a metamorphic example. And so this next picture is actually from an area that's right in here on the north side. And this was an area where there's some spectacular garnets that are in a, a peridotite, and many people wanted to sample the garnets or just get pieces of this. So this was in uh, 1976. And then you can see the difference just to the year 2000, how people had actually deepened <coughs> this, actually trying to expose um, and get some of the samples. And you can probably imagine what this would look like in 2019 or 2020, you know, 20 years later. Uh, it's probably even deeper than that. And again, you know, some of the geologists that worked in this, these areas, uh, here's one in front of a science says protected area in the Czech Republic. And now, those are our instruments, but it's just too easy to uh, maybe overuse those. In the Red Rock Conservation Area, here, actually near Casey Duncan's field area, um, there are these beautiful exposures of Aztec sandstone that are equivalent to the Navajo. And if you go up to one particular area, you see this. And uh, has anybody actually seen this particular area? It's right near a pullout um, in, in the park. And you look at that and you think, well, I wonder what that is. And if you get close up, here's a, somebody for scale. What you'd actually see is that a lot of people have left gum <coughs> on there. And they left gum of different colors. And again, you know, yes, there's lots of exposures, but what if this was covering up the very best of something? And I don't think we should get in the habit of doing that or thinking that's OK, because it's going to start being too prevalent, more than what we actually want. So I think the bottom line with ethics is that we should act responsibly. Uh, we should leave no trace. None of this stuff is biodegradable. We should have minimal impact. And if we have to sample, we should remediate. We need to all respect what the land use rules are or, or lose access to everybody. Um, I think as uh, people that are educators, we need to actually teach etiquette to our students about outcrops and uphold high ethical standards and really only hit the rock if we absolutely have to because a lot of times it's easy to pick up float. And just as an example, you can imagine how this rock used to be and somebody was getting a sample and even for a hand sample, this amount of damage to this outcrop is way too much. Um, and this is actually a site along the Amur River where uh, field trips mm -hmm. go all the time. And this is really damaging uh, the outcrop. So we need to preserve these localities, I think, for future generations, for future studies that actually might be able to do more than we can even do now. One way that to, to perhaps preserve some of these outcrops are to actually have new archive data that can do things um, in different ways than we've done before. And in particular, uh, CC has helped generate this particular uh, movie that I want to show on high resolution imagery. So sometimes things that aren't so accessible, maybe if we're able to do high resolution imagery, we can preserve that so that if we lose access in the future, at least there is a record of what's there. And uh, many students and researchers are using gigapans, um, doing photo, uh, photo scans that you can stitch together with, with Agisaw, and use a drone. And so I want to show um, an Exum channel in the Cretaceous Cedar Mountain near Hanksville. Um, and this is actually the uh, aerial view of that from Google Earth. 
And then we're going to zoom in to the small area that's in the red box. And this is where uh, Casey was able to put together quite a few uh, photos, um, over 500 of them. It took a lot of processing, although um, I think there's some faster ways now if you have some of the right uh, uh, computer uh, power. And uh, these are some of the DEM staff. But I, I hope we can go ahead and show this particular movie where this is looking towards the south south east. And Casey does this so you can look at an exhumed fluvial channel. You can actually zoom in and you can see that the um, outcrop exposure is about four meters high. Um, you can see the contact fairly well with the floodplain deposits underneath. Um, you can actually kind of trace out some of the surfaces and move around the outcrop. I guess if you want to say anything, you can just uh, chime in here. But in particular, you can see some of the uh, finding upward sequences. You can see some of the coarse lags with rip up class uh, towards the bottom. And then you can see some of the changes in the steps of these finding upward channels going from uh, larger sets at the bottom to smaller sets at the top. And so this might be a way to actually help teach students um, and help uh, provide scientific information even if we don't have direct access or we can't use hammers or that kind of thing. And you can nicely see some of the course material right down here at the bottom. So um, I think the drone imagery is actually something that can help us in preservation of our knowledge of future outcrops. Now the second story I wanted to talk about was the case of the missing marbles. And I think many of you know, uh, Brenda and I were doing some studies on some of these concretions with Bill Perry, who's uh, here today, uh, another former HINSI awardee. And what we have found is that in this particular area, uh, this is an area that's highly visited and um, has fairly easy access to the highway. And I think many of you know that these concretions are cemented mineral masses. Um, they have these spherical shapes, which are the minimum free energy shapes. And these are really an indicator of how fluids have moved through the rock in the past and preferentially cemented these balls. The Navajo sandstone is the unit that has some of the greatest variety of concretion, probably because it was such a porous unit and had multiple fluids over time. So as records of fluid flow, we can compare these to Mars. So these are the Martian examples here. Um, and this is where they've used false color to show where the spherical uh, forms are. Um, they called these blueberries because if you were able to see them with your naked eye, they would look kind of a bluish gray color. And then the way these spherules are distributed in the rock is sort of like blueberries in a muffin. They're actually physically dispersed and not um, touching each other. And that's the kind of relationship that we see with concretion that allows us to say that these are from groundwater flow conditions. So um, one of the things that's happened is that this is a resource where the shape of the ball and the size, golf ball size shapes, is something that's very attractive to people to pick up. And even though this is on BLM land, what we found is that these sites have been changing. So here's a picture from 2007. 2011, somebody had gone in with a front end loader and actually had a scoop, had actually scooped them up, stuck them in the front end loader, dumped them in five gallon Home Depot type buckets um, to sell uh, because they thought they could make money. And all of this was happening on Grand Staircase land. So the BLM uh, started an investigation into the theft and transport of the Moki marble. And also in 2015, there were another two suspects so there, there were five, although one of them was a repeat suspect. So um, a lot of the uh, issues were that BLM needed proof that these marbles that had been taken off the land were actually from Grand Staircase and didn't be from anywhere else. And so Brenda worked with me and we wrote up a report to try to document this. But you can see some of the changes and how I disturbed the area looks now. And really, the before and after images were quite sobering. They had actually tried to scoop them up and left some of these piles of leftovers uh, right there on this um, deflation surface. So Brenda and I went down to um, the BLM uh, warehouse where they had stored these. Um, in our first visit, they had 64 and a half buckets in 2012. Um, these were the ones that had been taken off the Grand Staircase property and over estimated at over 42,000 marbles with a value of over a third of a million dollars. And uh, these are fairly unique types of uh, 
of marbles and concretions and some of the things that are unique about them and the reason why we were able to tie these to Grand Staircase is because they have this unusual golf ball size. You know, there are not that many places where you can find 40,000 marbles all laid out like that. Um, they also have some fine saucer shapes uh, in addition to the spherical shapes, which are from some of the ridges where some of the fluids probably move preferentially along the Aeolian lamina. Um, the outer surface skin has some that look like avocado, and some have a very shiny patina that looks like a desert varnish. They also have an internal structure of rind. So here you can see one of our samples, and then you can see one of the uh, recovered BLM pieces. And these are largely the mineral uh, good bite, although the patients can be of multiple composition. So um, the felony charges against the uh, four Individuals were submitted and all four pled guilty. This actually summarizes the defendants here once before. Only one of them got a prison term. All of them got super re supervised release. Um, and this one here, number three, this was the one that was the rock uh, gem dealer. And so he got slapped with a slightly higher fine. But actually the fines were quite modest and one didn't even get a fine. So what's the future of these marbles? Well, um, this was really a kind of a unique case for BLM. And they said that for them, this was one of the biggest success stories because uh, it actually could be tied to a specific place. And the marbles themselves had a specific value. And sometimes it's very difficult to assign values to landscapes or rocks and that type of thing. So all of this took a long time. It was about five years before they actually came back to me and said, we're all done. Uh, now we have these 40,000 marbles. What do you recommend that we do with them? And so uh, the recommendation is that some should be returned to the original setting with the signs saying that they've been removed. Some should go to visitor centers and museums and programs. And actually, the UGS received a number, I think a couple of buckets, and then have distributed those in the state for K-12 uh, education. And uh, we should have a new display in the Sutton building um, by, by the spring where we will actually have some of these recovered balls that you should be able to see in person. Probably not all of the marbles were recovered and this was taken from show where um, there are still some for sale that should be for sale. And again, these have very distinctive properties and they do have a very specific value as you can see them marked here uh, on the outside. Other unethical behaviors do have repercussions, and uh, BLM is looking more seriously at actually having criminal prosecution. And so um, Pat Bagley said I could use this cartoon because I thought this was pretty cute. And I think all of you, or most of you, do remember the story of the hoodoo in Goblin Valley getting knocked over. Um, and again, this was difficult. While we know that this is a treasure and this shouldn't be done, um, what was the value of this hoodoo? And so in the end, um, the, uh, the person was cited as for criminal mischief, um, $2,500 fine and one year probation. Still, I think, pretty modest for something that was permanently damaged. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is what's going to happen in the future and uh, how can we use technology that's available to us to actually change how we do our science. And I think I've already demonstrated the use of drones and high resolution imagery that can actually document changes even over time. Um, that's something that many people have talked about doing. Um, there's also more information that's available to us in many different ways. And a lot of social media is increasing our awareness. And one application, for example, that I thought was quite interesting is one that's been developed is called Paratruth. And this is one where users can actually uh, report damage on Utah public land. So you could report if there was outcrop damage and you could uh, take pictures of it, you can upload those things, and you can let people know because uh, oftentimes um, the uh, BLM uh, personnel staff is quite limited and it actually helps them to have information where people are covering much broader areas than we typically can see. Also, there are a lot of changes in how we do science, and I think I used this picture once before, that in the old days, we used to take a lot of our data uh, in our field notebook. And now, uh, the new generation, which is now about half women, um, are using laptops, and we're using much more uh, um, smartphone and other uh, mobile devices to actually even do our data collection, as well as have back-end data management. 
So um, Earth Cube was a project that was promoted by NSF to try to advance our science and meet grand challenges by leveraging the power of cyber infrastructure. And they are encouraging all Earth scientists to put more of their data in digital format so that it can be used and accessed and shared much more easily. And uh, I had written this article with some colleagues about the future of field geology because probably some of the sedimentary geologists are the last ones to kind of get on board with this idea of using cyber infrastructure to actually take notes in the field and that type of thing. Um, a lot of the sedimentary data is very complex, it's multi-dimensional, um, it's very interpretive, and we have so many things that we want to describe and there's so many um, terms. But we have started on this path and we uh, are using um, a variety of different methods. And one um, project that has been quite successful is MacroStraft, um, and that's by Shannon Peters at the University of Wisconsin. He has actually taken a lot of the cohort data, some of the drilling data that's available in the U.S., put that all in a digital format, and now he has this program that's aimed more at the public that's called ROC, or ROCSI. And this particular program allows you to uh, pull up geologic maps, you can locate where you are at a particular point, and then it'll tell you what the subsurface geology is underneath your feet. So that's very convenient. And even many of the state uh, surveys, such as the Utah survey here, is doing uh, many more things with the digital maps and having different layers in which we can put different scientific information. Um, some of our field apps are actually uh, put on a system that was developed by some structural geologists. And this is one that's called Gravo Spot. And they said, um, you know, meet your new field assistant. This is going to be a tablet or a mobile app um, for structure and tectonics. Um, structure and tectonics is already a fairly quantitative type of science where they often take measurements and it's easy to translate that to uh, a handheld. But what we're trying to do for sedimentary geology is build on this um, uh, travel spot for field data collection and in particular we wanted to be able to generate stratigraphic columns and eventually have data management where we could say, show me all the places where there were isotelial currents. Or show me all the beds that show burrowing, or whatever it is that, that we need to know. So students are using this in the field to actually collect information, make it striking dip. Um, one of the biggest challenges is still the hardware, um, the ability to see the screen uh, in the sun, and battery life, and uh, having access to uh, internet. But this particular program, this is uh, kind of our first half uh, of our beta version. We have been able to do things so that we can generate a strat column. We can actually do this so that the strat column can actually be tied into the outcrop photo. So these beds that are sticking out here are approximately these beds that you can see here in the uh, shaded background. And you can actually kind of zoom in so that you can actually combine more of your field measurements with actually some of your outcrop type of data and your photos. So um, we're going to link many of these more. Uh, together, and we're really looking forward to rolling out a new version um, by the next CSA in Phoenix. Another program that might be of interest to people for uh, stratigraphy is a program that's called Strat Mobile. This was developed by Rick Almendinger, who is well known for doing the first paleo uh, stereo net uh, type of program. And he does a lot of programming just for fun. What he's done is he's developed this program so you can use your iPad or your smartphone. And you can actually use the eye on the phone that has a bar going across. So you can actually uh, line up the bar with the bottom of your bed and then tilt your iPhone or your, your uh, tablet up and measure the top of the bed and it'll give you that thickness based on the angle. Um, so this new, uses the <coughs> sighting so that you can actually um, get measurements. Um, you can kind of use your iPhone as a digital data staff and you can do all these different types of things and again, generate uh, different types of stratigraphic columns. So all of this is quite different than the way we've been collecting information in the past. I think it's very clear that all of the geologic community has to start adapting some of these things and providing input on what would best work with our workflow in order to get the best products that we can really use well into the future. So I wanted to show a short movie about how we can also perhaps have different layers of scientific information on GIS databases. 
Um, this is called Mars Tread, developed by NASA. And uh, if you just go ahead and start, I can talk a little bit about this. So this actually shows how you can zoom in uh, to different areas, much like we would do with Google Earth. But the idea here is that we might actually have a lot of our science information superimposed on a Google Earth. Different data from some of the different Mars missions. It allows you to actually compare and analyze between different data sets. So you can browse some of the highest resolution uh, remote sensing imagery at 25 centimeters per pixel. You could actually go in and do different kinds of calculations. So you could draw a line like that and instantaneously generate a elevational um, cross section. And you know maybe eventually we could do the same type of thing with generating a geologic cross section. This shows you where the current uh, orbiter location is, and you can actually um, get the actual GPS coordinates. You could select certain areas, and you can print out those areas on a 3D printer. And all this is available now. You know, so you could do this type of stuff now for Mars. And then to kind of show how this would work, uh, combining even popular uh, culture with science data, they've actually gone in and taken some of the different locations that. Um, were part of the movie The Martian, where Mark Watney would have actually had to get picked up and what his trek would have had to have been to actually uh, get to the area where he could uh, meet the pickup point. And so this is kind of a, um, a very interesting way to show how visualization can make a big difference in how we can see and imagine and uh, relationship. And so I think eventually this type of thing will um, and it's really kind of exciting because it's the future for the uh, next generation. So the bottom line here is that cyber technology and science together is really a hot topic. And this is uh, becoming much bigger even at some of the ACU meetings and GSA. This kind of integration is really going to allow us to make new kinds of discoveries and maybe even resurrect some of the type of legacy data that many of us have in our field notebooks that are just sitting on the shelf, um, you know, when you're ready to retire or something happens, don't just let that stuff get thrown out because maybe there's some important information there. And they are finding ways to actually scan data and actually archive it more so that it could be used uh, if somebody needs it in the future. And it also allows us to network. Um, I mean, the current young generation is very good at networking and communicating um, through cyber technology, and we should do the same for our science. So it is a very exciting future. So in summary, I'd like to just close with saying, number one, I think as scientists we have an ethical responsibility to our discipline. We should do our very best to conserve our heritage because we, of all people, are ones that understand and really appreciate the heritage and know what needs to be conserved for the future. We do need to leverage the new technology and get on board with what's happening because that might enable us to um, deserve and uh, document some of the, the heritage even better. And I think one thing that I would like to present to the UGA and the Utah Geological Survey is that we should more seriously consider some of these future opportunities to do educational signage. And this was brought up at the recent um, Bonneville Symposium that was held here um, just a little while ago, and that um, even the Utah Outdoors um, uh, group has money uh, that you can apply for that can actually be used towards signage. And it's on the order of tens of thousands of dollars. And perhaps we can actually leverage some of the money that's from UGA to actually try to help educate people. Because the more they know and understand about their landscape, the more likely they are to appreciate it and want to preserve it. And I think some of these um, Lake Bonneville um, landforms are particularly a case in point because some of these can be so equally improved. So uh, in closing, uh, this was the Stockton Bar. Uh, I think a great place to do signage. I want to say thank you very much to Utah's community. Um, I've, I've learned so much from a lot of you that are in this room and many of you have been very free to share information when I say, hey, Gus Sprinkle, what about this or that? Or Tom Chipsy, did you get me this on the fair? And uh, everybody's really been great. I have learned a tremendous amount from my students, uh, many colleagues, and I want to say thanks to my family. I feel the system and support group. So thank you very much.